What is the best martial class in 5e? Today, we discuss which sword swinger is slinging nat 20s and which one is kind of shooting blanks. Hello players and GMs, I am Reese, and welcome to another video by Jetpack7. Before we get started, I want to remind you to please like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Every click really, really helps us out a ton, so keep watching and keep interacting. We greatly appreciate the support. So last week, I ranked all the full casters in 5e from best to worst, and as promised, this week I will be ranking all the other classes, Barbarian, Fighter, Monk, Paladin, Ranger, and Rogue from best to to worst. Quick disclaimer, I said I was going to include the Artificer in this video. Next week's video, I'll be ranking every other class in 5th edition, Artificer included. Artificer included. But as I looked into the classes, the Artificer is just too different from the non-casters to justify really ranking it against them. In the future, I will likely do a video just dissecting the Artificer and finding its strengths and weaknesses, so keep an eye out for that. But for this video, I used much the same system as the last one. I created three categories to rate the strength of each class. Average damage per turn, overall viability, and beyond attacks. For average damage per turn, or as I like to call it, ADPT, I created what I would consider an average turn for each class at 20th level and averaged out the damage they would deal in that turn. Overall viability rates the strength of each class across all of its archetypes, whether those archetypes add to the power of the class or whether they really need to add to the power at all. By the nature of martial classes, there isn't too much variety in playstyle, even taking into consideration archetypes, so I didn't bother including that in the rating. And lastly, beyond attacks is pretty simple. What can the class do other than attack enemies, and how strong are those features? Each class was given a ranking in each of those three categories, one through six, six being the best in that particular category, one being the worst. At the end, I added up all the points, and whichever class had the most points is the best class ever of the martial classes. So, let's go ahead and hop into our ranking with the class I think most people would rate as the absolute worst overall class in 5e. With a whopping four points, we have the Ranger. It is important to note that I used the base Ranger for this video, not the revised Ranger or any other UA material. I felt it necessary to just use official Wizards of the Coast material, because the moment you start to introduce unreleased content, things start to get a bit fuzzy. Which is a shame, because the base Ranger is trash. Sorry, Ranger fans. I honestly really love to play rangers, but you just have to be objective when you're making videos like this, and this class just really needs some love. Rangers had the lowest average damage per turn at 32. I considered an average turn for a 20th level ranger to include two longbow attacks with Hunter's Mark and Foe Slayer added to one of those attacks. They have some spells that can add damage, but I wouldn't consider expending those higher level slots as an average turn. For overall viability, I was actually pretty impressed with the strength of the ranger archetypes, but still had to place the ranger at 5th place. They definitely managed to take the class from being a complete dumpster fire at base, to being at least relatively playable and fun. Hunter and Gloomstalker stood out to me as being the strongest in terms of combat power, and I really liked the flavor of the Horizon Walker. With the right conclave, you might be able to rival an archery style fighter when taking into account the utility gained by certain features and spellcasting, but all that said, you're still limited by an incredibly underwhelming set of base class features. My favorite example is the ranger's 14th level ability called Vanish, which allows you to take the hide action as a bonus action. So basically, you get one third of the rogue's second level feature at 14th level. Nice. Oh, also, did I mention the Beastmaster Ranger? No! Oh. In Beyond Attacks, the Ranger once again placed in last. They have spellcasting, but they have easily the worst spellbook in 5e, with a whole bunch of spells that fulfill very niche purposes. Some of the expanded spell lists gained through archetypes are decent, but not enough to make it good. And other than that, the Ranger doesn't really get many noteworthy features that don't involve attacking. In fifth place, nearly doubling the Ranger with seven points, we have the Barbarian. The Barbarian is a class that excels at pretty much one thing, running up, hitting stuff, and getting hit by stuff. And that tends to take away some of the power in the other facets of the class. The Barbarian placed in 5th in ADPT, just above the Ranger with 36 damage. For most of the classes, I operated under the assumption that they were using a D8 weapon. However, I think the most popular weapon for a Barbarian by far is the Great Axe, due to its synergy with Brutal Critical. 
Taking that into account with two attacks and rage damage, the average turn ends up at 36 damage. It would be much higher with a critical hit, of course, but a crit definitely doesn't happen on an average turn due to, you know, statistics. In overall viability, I place the Barbarian in fourth place. The Barbarian has a couple very powerful archetypes, namely the Totem Path and the Zealot Barbarian. I think those two stand out as the strongest by far. Going Bear Totem gives you resistance to every single type of damage other than Psychic, which is the most uncommon type of damage in the game. Zealot Barbarian has this fun 14th level feature where you can't die unless you're raging. And then the base Barbarian class feature at 15th level, just one level further, is that rage doesn't end until you choose to end it or are incapacitated. So basically you're just this unkillable raging wood chipper, which is pretty dang strong. The reason Barbarian is fourth here is because it doesn't really matter too much what other features you give this class because it's going to be decently strong due to the Rage ability. Which brings me to Beyond Attacks, which for the Barbarian, much like most Barbarian PCs, consists entirely of Rage. I placed it at fifth here just above the Ranger because they don't really get anything other than Rage. They can gain advantage on attacks every turn while granting enemies advantage on them, but you don't really care about all that when you have resistance to all that damage and a d12 hit die. Again, there aren't many features for Barbarian beyond attacks, but the one they do get is fortunately very, very potent. In fourth place at eight points, I have the Monk. I love Monks. I really do. I love DMing them. I've never had issues with them. I love Stunning Strike. It has never once turned a deadly boss into a pinata full of XP and magic items for the party. In all seriousness though, I do love the Monk. I just think that the class suffers from much the same problem as Warlock and Barbarian, in that one part of their kit is intensely strong, so the rest of it has to be a little less so. The average damage per turn for monks was 44, putting them in third place. At 20th level, each of the monks' attacks deal a d10, and I think it is pretty average for a monk with 20 key points to spend one of those attacks on a flurry of blows to make four attacks that turn. In overall viability, however, I actually had the monk at last place. I think the archetypes of the monk are the most underwhelming out of all of the classes in 5e. None of them really stand out to me as being super strong by themselves, nor do they really add much power to the class itself. I like the directions that they're going, but it just misses the mark for me. Open Hand and Kensai seem to be the strongest due to the utility and extra damage offered by them respectively, and Shadow is fun if you have regular access to Dim Light or Darkness, plus being able to cast spells with key points is cool, but I'd much rather be spending those key points on... something else. Which brings me to Stunning Strike. I mean, Beyond Attacks. So, Stunning Strike. But really, I placed Monk at 4th in Beyond Attacks largely because the Monk kind of ends up being a stunning strike machine once they gain access to it. The best feature they get otherwise is evasion, which is super helpful, granted, and they also get slow fall and deflect missiles, which is fun but rarely much of a game changer. Being able to stun a creature until the end of your next turn is absolutely insane. Not to mention the fact that key points restore on a short rest, so you can spam out stunning strikes left and right. Eventually, no matter how strong the boss, they're going to fail the save and promptly die, and then your DM is going to have to pretend they're not not really, really sad. So yeah, Stunning Strike is really strong, which is why the monk gets fourth place in this category, but that kind of means their other features are a little more underwhelming. In third place, with 11 points, we have the Fighter. The Fighter is just the combat class. They only placed in fourth in ADPT with 40 points. At 20th level, a Fighter has four attacks per turn. With a Longsword, that averages out to be 40 damage per turn. I considered adding an action surge, which would take that damage up to 80, but considering you only get two action surges per rest, it's hard for me to justify considering that an average turn. In overall viability, the fighter gets placed in third. The fighter's archetypes are all pretty good, largely because they just continue to play around the idea that the fighter can attack 50,000 times. Champion Fighter gets the single strongest mechanic out of all of them, increasing your crit chance to up to 15% at high levels. Otherwise, Battlemaster offers tons of utility with the battle maneuvers, Arcane Archer and Cavalier both encourage a totally different playstyle and do a pretty good job of making those playstyles very strong. Eldritch Knight, to me, is the worst of them all, because it's the only archetype that doesn't really take advantage of the many attacks a fighter can get. In fact, it kind of moves in the opposite direction. It encourages you to spread your stats thin, and there just aren't that many spells in 5e that don't require some sort of spell attack or saving throw, so your spellcasting ends up being pretty lackluster. But again, the fighter is kind of just the wizard of the martial classes. It doesn't really matter what you choose as your archetype, because you're going to be decently strong regardless. For Beyond Attacks, I also have the fighter in third. 
Despite the fact that this class gets a bunch of features involving attacks, it also gets some insanely powerful mechanics that have nothing to do with hitting stuff. Action Surge is definitely the most powerful part of their kit, but they also get Second Wind, which gives you some self-healing as a bonus action, and Indomitable, which allows you to reroll saving throws. And something that I think goes largely unnoticed and unappreciated for fighters is the fact that they get an additional ability score increase or feat at both 6th and 14th level. Every other class in the game gets 5 total, while the fighter gets 7. That pretty much guarantees that you can get every feat and every ability score increase you could ever want, making the fighter an extremely potent class in pretty much any combat situation, regardless of whatever archetype you take. And in second place, with a big jump up to 16 points, we have the Rogue. The Rogue is one of my favorite classes in the game. For average damage per turn, they actually placed in first simply because of sneak attack. At 20th level, the Rogue's sneak attack deals 10d6, averaging out to 40 damage. Add rapier damage and dexterity to that, and you're dealing 50 damage every single turn. That's pretty huge. In overall viability, I place the Rogue at second place. Not only does the base class get some incredible features, but each of the archetypes offer extremely unique identities and strengths. In terms of combat strength, Swashbuckler and Assassin are certainly the biggest hitters, but every other archetype offers some awesome utility as well. Mastermind can use the 8 action as a bonus action from 30 feet away, the Inquisitive Rogue can get sneak attack bonuses by insight checking opponents, and of course the Arcane Trickster gets plenty of utility with the additional uses of Mage Hand and access to the Wizard Spellbook. Tack that on to a rather potent base class, and you've got yourself one very powerful character across the board. And in Beyond Attacks, I also placed the Rogue at second place. Some might argue that the Rogue should win this due to just how much the Rogue gets. They are incredibly mobile, they have some of the best action economy in the game, they get evasion, uncanny dodge, reliable talent, proficiency in wisdom saves down the road, and stroke of luck at 20th level. Not to mention the roguish expertise you get as you level up, making you just the best at several different skills. Honestly, as a DM, it is very, very difficult to keep a rogue from getting into a locked house and stealing everything. The rogue really is just an incredibly efficient class, all the way from levels 1 through 20, and in addition to the big hits from sneak attack, they get some of the best non-attack features of any class in the game by far. And finally, in first place with just one more point than the Rogue, we have the Paladin. Much like its cleric brothers and sisters, the Paladin is just an excellently designed class. In average damage per turn, the Paladin fell into second place with 45 damage. I considered an average turn for the Paladin to be two attacks, one of them with a third level smite. Taking into account that every attack on 20th level deals an additional 1d8 radiant damage, and the fact that Paladins have plenty of spell slots to pour into smites at that point, I think this is a pretty plausible average turn. In overall viability, I have the Paladin at first place. Every single Paladin Oath feels very, very strong to me. The fact that they get not only a channel divinity, but also free spells, much like the Cleric, make every Oath at least decent. Most of the features they get from the Oaths otherwise can completely change the course of the fight, not to mention every single Capstone feature turns them into freaking Superman for a minute. Conquest and Devotion in particular stand out to me as the most powerful Oaths, but others like Crown and Vengeance offer some fun mechanics which change up the feel of the character entirely. And again, I think this is just a sign of a well-designed class because the Paladin can go pretty much any direction they want without feeling like they've sacrificed too much power. And in Beyond Attacks, I once again had the Paladin in first place. It's pretty simple. The Paladin spellbook is filled with some of the most powerful spells in the game that only the Paladin and the Bard can access. Their channel divinities, though not as strong as the Clerics, offer a lot of power and variety to the class as well. The Paladin's Aura, which increases saving throws of allies around them, is an incredible support feature, which requires the Paladin to literally just exist near you. And of course, Lay on Hands is a great get-out-of-jail-free card that can heal yourself or an ally for anywhere from 1 to 100 points without even having to roll a die. Taking all of this into account, I can pretty confidently place the Paladin in first, just above the Rogue, because this is simply a very, very powerful class. So, that is my list of the strongest martial classes in 5e. I'm now done with both of them. Let me know in the comments what you think about my rankings. If your arguments are good enough, I might just change it around a bit in the future. I look forward to hearing from you, but until then, thank you all very, very much for watching, and we'll see you around.